What's up, you guys? This is Kershaw St. Johnson, and I'm here with All Hip Hop with a special, 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 special guest. We're here talking to the legendary Benny Boom, video director, now movie director, now big popping with as a movie director, executive producer, and all of that stuff. Benny, introduce yourself to our fans. What's up, All Hip Hop? Um, I'm Benny Boom. Um, this is um, so actually funny enough, I'm celebrating my 20th year in the game, actually more now. 21st year uh, as directing. Um, and it's just a great opportunity, you know, uh, this film, Tasmanian Devil, I'm producing this film, not directing it. And it's just been uh, such a great journey and a great opportunity to give another young filmmaker, not, you know, a chance. That's cool, but wait a second. I'm not quite ready for uh, this interview about Tasmanian Devil, which is an amazing, mm -hmm. if you can hold on for a second. Yeah. I have to get really, ready for <laughs> this amazing you gotta amazing get ready movie. ready ready here we you know, go you caught me off guard i ain't got none of my you know i'm out of pocket right now yeah I'm I'm do, do you belong to a um a, um greek letter organization yes i am a, a member of alpha phi alpha fraternity incorporated i am uh i play spring 91 at pyro chapter at temple university i'm the first solo at the chapter so um, yeah, so I said I feel distinguished on a whole lot of levels, um, but yeah, I'm an alpha. I'm an alpha. You're an alpha. You're a one and an alpha. Yes, yes. There we go. What up, Ace? I'm an Ace. What's oh, where did like you pledge? I, I actually did Brooklyn alumni chapter, but I went to yeah. spell him. Yeah, I was yeah, too busy yeah. Working to to do Ada Kappa, but yeah, I've, I've basically been a Delta all my life in my spirit. There we but, go. Um, I've been about you know um, almost almost ten years in the in the sorority, okay. so. Yeah, Super I'm excited. I'm celebrating 30 years this year, so it's crazy. Yeah. And you don't look no older than 30. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I look I'm older. saying these kids be looking rough nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just try to take care of myself, water, exercise, good eating, you know, good life. Well, you said that you were celebrating 20 years in mm -hmm. um, the business. Can you talk a little bit about your journey? How did you move from Philly to uh, the big streets of New York and to the big streets of the music industry? So I started, you know, I was, um, I went to Temple University after graduating high school at Old Brook High School. Um, and I, I studied film. Um, I was actually a double major in African-American studies and film. And uh, from there, I got an opportunity to move to New York and intern with Spike Lee on uh, Clockers. Uh, it was at that moment that I, I was just, you know, I wanted to be a director, but then when I got to New York, I realized the harsh realities of trying to make it. And this is 1994 of trying to make it in the business, which was really, really tough. Um, I think I stayed in that. I, I was in that mode of direct, of, uh, of PA for quite a few years, worked with uh, some of the greats in filmmaking, Woody Allen, John McTiernan, um, Spike Lee, of course, um, Sidney Pollack. I mean, these are like giants of, of filmmaking. And I was a production assistant on a lot of these films. Then I got an opportunity to uh, meet and work at Big Dog Films, which was Hype Williams' company. And that's really when everything uh, sort of changed the direction of my life. And um, instead of just wanting to make movies, I realized that I had an avenue in by making music videos, by directing videos. So I was always attached to music. I was a rapper at one point in time and all this stuff. So it all sort of came together at Big Dog under Hype's tutelage. What was your favorite uh, film to, I mean, music video to work on? Um, well, that I didn't direct would have been Big Pimpin' because, you know, we all like, it was myself, Hype, Little X. We all went to, to, to Trinidad to shoot that video. And I always say when people ask me, it's like, that was the beginning of the end in terms of uh, we watched like $2 million be spent on a video. Um, and it was super successful it was big and it sort of was the benchmark of hip-hop i think that video you know we had a whole bunch of videos before then the music and stuff but it was something about that moment in time where hip-hop arrived and you realize it's not going anywhere you're not going anywhere um and so that was a great experience for me because it was on that video where um hype turned to me uh i think we were shooting like our third or fourth day and he said to me he said look you know um if you want to direct, you got to direct. You can't just be an assistant director anymore. You got to 
be a director. So it sort of was him telling me that he wasn't going to hire me anymore as an AD <laughs> in order for me to to move out and do my own thing. So it was it was a good thing to happen. It was a good thing to happen. It was a very it was a very great uh, shoot to be on. It, it's definitely a historic moment. So what was the different? What was the, the feeling going from music video producer mm -hmm. and in high, high regard mm -hmm. to being a, a film director? Like like going from one to one. From one to another is you starting at the bottom. I mean, um, you know, you are starting from from the beginning. You know, um, I mean, T D Jakes uh, had said one time he had used this analogy of like moving up. So if you go from one to ten, when you at ten, that's the highest point you can be. In order to get to twenty. You got to start at 11, which is the lowest point of of those teams. And same thing with 30 starting at 21. And so when you go from music video director having success to stepping into the film game, you starting back at starting back at one. You have to reprove yourself. Um, there's a certain amount of rebranding that has to happen because people know you for one thing um, and you're trying to get them to understand that you're something else. Uh, so. That's really important, and, but you also have to know that you have to work harder. It's hard. It's hard to get from one to ten. It's even harder to get from eleven to twenty, you know, or and all the way up. Um, and so when I say that, it means that the challenges are different. Um, where you would be calling all the shots, you may not be calling all the shots in in the film world or in the television world. So those are the things that um, I had to sort of sort of overcome in order to make this make the leap. And what were some of the things that you saw were different from being um, working as a director for music videos mm -hmm. versus regular films outside of the, just the length? Um, the narrative aspect of it, um, you know, music videos, you're telling a story in three minutes uh, sometimes, or it could be just a performance or it could be just art direction. I think I was pretty much known for the, the narrative part of it. Um, I think, you know, some of my, um, my peers were known for different things. You know, X was, is, is, you know, from, to me is the goat, Like he could go from storytelling to the set designs that no one has ever seen before, taking one line across the back of a set and making that into something, you know, he specialized in that. For me, I, I really was always wanted to, to, to narrate, be narrative with the story. And so my concepts were always about um, taking the artist, the rapper, the singer, and putting them through some kind of journey. And like, for example, like um, A. Marie's video, Why Don't We Fall In Love, right? That was her first video. Um, no one had ever seen her before. And the story of that was was very simple. It was her leaving the house to, she was in love, it's the first day of summer, right? So that was the love that she was talking about. And so she goes through this Brooklyn neighborhood and she sees a guy, we don't know if that's a man or if it's just somebody she likes. Then she comes to the park and she's just in love with the moment of that day. And that's the story, you know, um, or something as deep as the Mob Deep video that I did where they go in and they happen to look like the guys who rob the Mexican drug dealers and they come. So it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it ranges from that to that, but somewhere in there, there is a narrative, there is a story thread in, in the work that I tried to do, that I've done. I, I think that what I like about the work that you do is that there's always, I don't wanna say plot twist, mm -hmm. but it's always something you, you don't expect the end. And yeah. you never really can expect what the twist is gonna be. It's funny. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I think the person that I was able to do that the most with is Keisha Cole. Like we we done we done a lot of videos together. And um, I was really able to, we, we would talk these ideas out for like, you know, weeks. Like I would hear the song or I'd go to the studio, hear the song a week or two would go by. We're talking about what the idea should be. Um, we're drawing off of some of her personal experiences and I'm lending my personal experience. And then we get and we start to shoot it and we come up with these things that are twists, whether it's, you know, the love video with, with Tyrese, where there was a twist at the end and stuff like that. So we always wanted to challenge um we wanted to be challenging with it. And I think I sort of learned from working with her um, early on, again, a new artist and being able to be on the ground floor of their, of their career, learn from her uh, the idea of making, this, having the story, following it and then twisting it at the end and having a resolve. So, yeah. Is that something that attracts you to projects? Like when you're looking at like a, a particular artist, you're like, oh, that artist might be fun and I can do something crazy. What attracted you to certain music artists to write? Was it just the money? 
because that could be it too. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's the money if it's a, if it's a big enough budget. But there, for me, it was always um, I gotta like it. You know, if I don't like it, I can't come up with an idea and fake the funk. And, you know, you know, I'm from Philly. Like we we don't play them games where you just faking the funk and 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 kind of skating your way through it. You know, so. Um, I had to, I'd have to like the artist first, be inspired. I think inspiration is the biggest thing. Um, if you're not inspired, it shows the work shows, everything shows. And then if you put up, put out enough uninspired work, then all of a sudden you, you know, you're not good anymore. So I think everything you go into, you go into with the best intentions of making something great and hopefully it'll, it'll come out. So for me, you know, the music initially is the grab for me, whether it's R and B or hip hop. I love it. And so Tasmanian Devil, which we're here to kind of talk about, mm -hmm. is a great film that kind of deals with um, a lot of things. A lot of cultural mm -hmm. dynamics are going yeah. on here. But the core of it, the center of it is um, Black Greek life. Mm -hmm. What was it about this particular project that was interesting to you, that attracted you? Well, here's the thing. I, I You know, it's funny you say that because... Um, being a black Greek myself, when, when I first read the script and then our final outcome and, and, and watching different iterations of the edit and stuff like that, the story to me is really about fatherhood. And, and, and it, you know, um, we could extract the story, um, a Dio's story, and put it into another world, meaning another, uh, take it out of the college world, and you have this this son who's estranged from his father, who wants to go live with his father, and it's not everything that he thought it was gonna be. That's real. That's the core of the story. So when we have that, that's something that everyone can relate to. So whether you've been to college, whether you pledged, whether you didn't want to pledge, whether you hated the Greek Sanad, whether you went to a white school, black school, the idea that you have, um, that there is a relationship that you have with a parent um, that just can't be resolved. And because of, that you're seeking resolutions outside of family and friends become family. This is how people get into gangs. This is how people get into drug usage. This is how, you know, that sort of thing. So that is a common thread um, through this film. Then you add, which a lot of times is um, a taboo subject, you add um, religion and black, you know, in the black culture, the black church, into this storyline. So we have quite a few different themes going through. And I think Solomon, I don't want to leave, um, the, let, I don't want to continue without mentioning Solomon Onita Jr., who is the writer and director of this film. Um, he did a masterful job at crafting a script, uh, casting, finding the locations, doing all these things to bring the story to life. Because um, with all these different themes in the film, it's easy to lose track on a story like this, but he really kept it together and tied everything up in, a, in an amazing way. You know, I think that I think that you hit on something really. I'm 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 deeply in the church. I'm actually a reverend, and mm -hmm. so um, it's interesting to see the difference, the nuance difference between African Christianity and mm -hmm. how it is very Pentecostal and very right. um, orthodox compared to American Christian, Black American Christian, the Black American church. And right. can you talk about um, the research, I guess, that Solomon did, or if you spoke with Solomon about how did he um, craft this particular religious experience? Because it starts in Africa, and then right. it, it ends here. Well, I think that um, one thing is that um, that's that's amazing that you're a reverend. I'm a Christian myself, so it's it's amazing. That's the, That was one of the story points that hit me um, through through the my whole career and everything like that. I've been always I've been trying to find a way to tell a story, a faith based story that's not cookie cutter or that's too clean. Because the reality is, when by the time you're an adult and you come to Christ, you've been through some stuff, you know, and it's not always just feeling sick and someone praying for you and then you better and then you go to Christ. Most of the time, there's been something tragic that happens in your life. Um, someone's been killed, you've been closely killed, um, you've committed something, uh, a sin that you feel as though you, you'll you never recover from and someone um, nudges you towards God, right? So these movies, those types of movies, 
for our community don't really get told because there is a taboo about, oh, is there profanity in the movie or is it? But that's real life. That's real life, right? So there still is the opportunity to make a film like that. And I think that this film comes close to that, um, where you have a man who uh, he's flawed, the father's flawed. He is, he's a, a missionary. Um, he has an idea of what his life is like. He's given his life to Christ, but he's still a human being at the end of the day. So he gave to Christ, but he neglected his son and his wife. And he's built this church on a foundation, but the foundation isn't solid. And his son comes and he thinks he's coming to, to live with this monolith of a man and realizes that this guy is not, he has nothing together. You know, he's just not together at all. So um, that is, you know, that part of, of the story to me is like really important. And I hope that when people see it, they get that thread, that they understand um, that we're not, like like I said, there's so many different levels to it, right? And you watch, and, and, and you watch Natari, the actor, right? And he's so powerful. You know, if people are not familiar with him, he's in the shy. He's, he, I forget his character's name in the shot, but he's he such a in the shy. He, Broke he, my heart. In the shy. Um, he's such a powerful figure. Um, and he and, and his his performance in this film is is amazing. And so you want to ride with the father, but you also feel for Dio, who's the, who's the kid, right? And as a parent, I have four children. I understand the dad's plight. And the kids gonna want to do what they want to do, and you try to steer them in the right in the right direction. Um, but you know, it, it it it's important when you see him that you understand he thinks he's seeing everything from God's point of view, and he's missing some things. He's so blinded, and I hate to say that, but he's so uh, uh, blinded by that that he's missing uh, what his son is trying to tell him. It also seems like not that he's just blinded by. God's vision, mm -hmm. but it kind of looks like he's trying to live through the promise of his son. Yeah. He wants his son to be everything that he yeah. was not. So yeah. that's kind of interesting. Talk about the research for the Divine Nine kind of um, part of it. Like it's, right. it's such a big part of the story. Yeah. And it's so authentic. Like I'm an ace, you're an ace. Mm -hmm. You you probably didn't have to do this, but the slapping of the leg to start everything mm -hmm. is very interesting. And, well, and the, to see it there, I'm like, someone knows what they're talking about. Right. So um, <laughs> it's interesting. So there are, you know, whenever you do these types of films that, that explore uh, secret society and things of that nature, um, we there's, there's things you don't want to give away in it and that you have to give away because you're trying to tell parts of the story. Um, and Solomon is Solomon's an alpha as well, and so there are things that that um, that are general to the pledge process that we had to put in the film in order to tell the story correctly. So again, if this was a story about a young kid wanting to get into gangs because he's you know he can't connect his father and the gang is is his becomes his family, we would see that transition, and so we would expose some things um, in the gang culture to make it feel honest and, and, and realistic. So, uh, you know, in terms of research, you know, we live through it, you know, Solomon lived through it. He's, he's been through it. And, uh, so he was able to, to, to express it. You know, one thing I learned from a few writers, a few writer friends of mine, um, you know, you write what you know. I know Kenya Barris and I used to talk all the time and he would say, you write what you know, you know, your main character should be, should be you in some way, shape, or form. Your main character is you going through the going through the story. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you say? Because it's a tough film to watch for mm -hmm. people who are who are a part of the culture, but also people who are not a part of the culture. And some may say that it's a glamorization of maybe some things that should not be uh, really talked about in the culture. Mm -hmm. um, What do you say about that? How do you feel about that? I say it's, you know, it's a story. It's like we, again, 
when we're out here telling these stories, we see, here's the thing. You have black writer, black director, black producers, um, Birdman from Cash Money came on to help finance the film, right? He doesn't have the college experience, but he understands, he understood uh, what Solomon, I mean, what, what the Dio's character was going through in the film because he could relate to that. We can't be scared when we tell our stories. It's when other people tell our stories that we that we should get concerned. Here's an opportunity for us to tell our story, our story of Black Greek life. Um, and and I'll say this: you know, there was no hindrance from any outside voices about how to tell this story. Even even Solomon and I going back and forth, or maybe a few scenes, or with structure, or anything like that, didn't impact what the story was about, because it's a, it's a very unique situation um, to us as African-Americans. And it's made known by this kid coming from Africa, coming here and never have having heard of this before and understanding why it's so important. Right. Yeah, I think that I think that you hit it really beautifully when you look at the DP and his relationship with um, Dial's character. Yeah. So because it's gentle it's, it's beautiful. It's, to me, I think it's beautiful when you see I see something in you mm -hmm. and I and I got you. Like, yeah. so that, that's a lot of it too. Well, he becomes the father. So in, in the story and, you know, he becomes the father figure that Solomon is, that, that I keep saying Solomon. I always did this too, that Dio's looking for, I'm putting him as the character, that Dio's looking for. Um, he, you know, I was a dean at one time and, 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 you know, I happened to, as when I was the Dean of Pledges, the DP, one of the kids had tried to, one of my, uh, Neil, he had tried to come out once before and, um, didn't make it. And then there was a lot of pushback from the chapter about him coming back a second time. It's just, it was just our culture. Like if you didn't make it the first time, we wasn't trying to have you back. So I really went to bat for him, not only as a Dean, but he was my friend and all those things and what i found in that which was different than when i was a neo or an adp is that i really was in a in a position to shepherd these men it was we had it was three of them and i was in a position to shepherd these men into alpha and so while everything else crazy was going on i was always going to remain constant i was going to be the constant right and so if things got crazy in a you know, in situation, you look to me because I'm the constant. You're never gonna have to, you know, the trust is built is built there. And so, you know, in a movie, he, he the DP, you know, he's in his mind is like this kid got a 4.0. Our grade point average goes up. We look better, you know, in, in to nationals and everything like that. He's doing it for that. But when he talks to 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 Dio, he realizes I can actually fill this kid's life. This is the kid that the organizations, whether it's Alpha or Kappa or Delta or AK, the, that is the kid, and that's what the organiz that's what the Black Week Letter organization is about. Taking that kid who has promise, who uh, has vision, but doesn't have it all together, you know, and, and taking and shaping that and molding that, and that's what he sees. Now I see you guys are alpha. You said that Solomon is an alpha, mm -hmm. and you are an alpha. Mm -hmm. But them devils look like they were sigmas. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know. It's funny. Not just the blue, but they just, just the blue, slide, but, like. Oh yeah, that's funny. It's funny you say that too because when he when we first when I first read the script, I was, I was like, you know, because he pledged in Texas, and so I'm like, you know, the sigmas are, are, are the devils, and he said, yeah, yeah, but this is Taz. You know, it all makes sense. Tau Alpha Zeta, Tasmanian devil playing off of that that whole thing. Um, but in that, in that regard, you know, it sort of encapsulates everything, all the Greek life, you know, it, it, it gives a nod to, to everybody, you know what I mean? Um, in that way, because it's all part of our culture. Look, one of my, one of my co-writers is a new that went to school with me, you know? Um, and I think what, one thing is that we have as Greek led organizations, and I think we're getting it back now. I think we've lost our way over in the two in the two thousands and two thousand tens of what we are what we're supposed to be doing, um, we're finding it now. The riot, the, you know, the protests and riots from the summer, um, sort of reminded us that we have a responsibility. And so you saw people on the front lines wearing their letters. They wanted you to know, Alpha's out here. 
you know, the Q's is out here, the Delta's out here, the AK's out here, Sigma's out here, Kappa's out here. Like, we out here. When you So when you see us protesting, you see us. And, it, and I took a lot of pride in that. You know, if I'm looking at, I was looking at TV and I see something and it was a black, weak, black organization, it wasn't an alpha, I was still proud because I know that that person understands the responsibility that they have in this community. And I think we don't do it enough. You know, I think that, you know, if we got together much more, you know, we wouldn't have the violence in Chicago and Philadelphia and all those things if we if we really picked up the mantle and, and walked the streets the way we're supposed to at night and at the daytime and, and be present in these kids' lives the way we're supposed to, we can do, we can make a lot of change. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, it's just not a vanity change. Like, you know, we have, um, you know, Cam Kamala Harris as the vice president and it's great that she's an AKA, that's amazing. But where does the work start? Now she has a responsibility because now in all the ads that you see, I just saw a commercial about talking about her life and they they have they have the, all the divine nine up there and the banners and stuff that I love it, but you got to you know where's the work start? Now she's in a position to to get everybody all over the country start these little pockets of all these alumni chapters and even undergrads to get together and say, hey, what are you guys doing in Los Angeles in the community of Baldwin Hills, you know, or the Baldwin community or, or you know. Um, Crenshaw community. I don't see no alphas out there. I don't see no AKs out there. I don't see, no, oh, well, we live over here. No, no, no. Be, get out in the street. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So films like this, I think uh, at the core, it's about, you know, the hazing part and the pledging part, but it's what comes after that's really important. You know the check is an alpha, you know? Yeah. And I hear you saying a lot of um, amazing, amazing divine love stuff, but this movie is incredibly first family biased. <laughs> you have AKAs there, and you yeah, got AKAs the there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, what's yeah. going on? It's like one little half a picture of a Delta on the phone. <laughs> but you know, you know that we can't like legally. You know, they're just they're the K's, but it's not AKs, the colors and stuff. No, but I feel you. You know, Solomon. I think Solomon, as a director, had you know made some choices based on his personal experience and stuff like that. So. um so yeah, no, it's 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 funny. It's it's first family bias a little bit. <laughs> would you would you have made some different choices um, as a director than Solomon? Or because he's like, I, I would assume he's like your little brother in directing, mm -hmm. maybe your little brother in a frat also. Would yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, I think every director is going to make different choices. Um, but would they be better or worse? We don't know. But they definitely, you know, they would have been different. Um, every director is going to come at material differently. Um, like right now I do, I direct a lot of television. So when you come into TV, you know, come in as a director for television, um, everything is set up for you. And so you, when I say set up, it's written, the storyline, the episode before you and the episode after you, um, is other directors. So your episode has to connect and connect, but what are you going to do differently? So I'm going to make different choices with given the same actors, same locations, same basic storyline. I'm going to make different choices than the director before me or after me. And it's, you know, I do all American black lightning, you know, shows like that. And, um, you know, these are storylines that the threads that go all the way through the whole season. And as a director, you have to make specific choices that, um, that show that your that is your vision, you know, I know you said that um, Birdman, you guys brought him in as an EP, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we put some a lot of money behind it. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that he has a lot of influence with the music and the sound. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Talk to me yeah. about what was that like, and the music just seamlessly really tied everything together. Yeah, yeah, part of that is Solomon. I mean, Solomon grew up in Texas, in Houston. Um, it's funny, when, when I finally was able to introduce, Birdman had already gotten involved with the film, and I got him the script and got him the first rough cut. And he came on to help us finish the financing. And so when he met Solomon, um, he asked him, you know, and I just remember that meeting, he said, hey, young man, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Houston. And Solomon was a little nervous. And he was nervous because he really, being from Texas and the South, like cash money with God's to him, you know? So he really was being able to sit in the room 
It was just the three of us sitting in a room. We watched, he had, Birdman had already seen the film, but had watched a couple of scenes and asked questions, right? So we're not just talking about somebody that just gave us money and walked away and said, you know, let me know when it's done. He had questions, you know, he asked about the actors. He commented on scenes. He asked Solomon about his next movie, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so he treated our relationship and our situation with the film the same way he would do the music, you know, sitting with an artist, listening to the album, right? Asking a question about a song, um, asking them what, what's the next song they're gonna make or next album or who you gonna get, that kind of thing. It was a very um, nurturing meeting and I was I was glad to be able to set that up. I was very glad to, to for this to be in my first sort of uh, producing EP of a film, to be able to bring somebody on from my music career from my music side just very interested and to have them come in and be a part of it i thought it was i thought it was great um and even today you know just talking to him today and, and going over some things he's uh you know all the way in on on promoting the film because bigger than the movie he sees that we gave a young black filmmaker an opportunity to make a move make a film and that's what uh intrigued him the most about it yeah, the cast was great. The, um, I mean, you see the filmmaker. I mean, it's just a fresh, fresh, fresh movie. Yeah. Speaking of fresh, fresh movies, um, you went to Brook. Yeah. From West Philly. Yeah. Well, you're from a lot of places, but we're gonna hang yeah. you in West Philly because the, the, the crew, the crew claims you. Yeah, the crew. So, there is a rumor uh -huh. that you may be interested in doing a biopic or biopic on a uh, Steady B. Cool C and the Hills I Puzzle. Can you talk about well, why would that be important and who will watch it other than me? So it's it's interesting. You know, I've had a lot of conversations. I went to school with those guys. I think Boob Boob is steady B. He was out of school by the time I was there, but 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 uh Chris was there, Cool C was there. You know, their story is very Shakespearean. Um it's a tragic story of hip hop at a time when we didn't have a lot of tragic stories in hip hop. Um and you know, for us as Philadelphia, we always felt like, you know, we we had a chip on our shoulder from New York and we always felt like we had to um, battle New York in some way, shape or form. And here we had Steady B, who who when he started his career, went at LL Cool J, who was just the the, the goat even at that time. Um, so telling a story about them in that time period and watching what happened, what, where they went to. And what actually happened to them, I think, is important, um, not only because it's a Philadelphia story. You know, um, I lived around it. I was I, I love the music, the people, the neighborhood was all my neighborhood. Um, so I, I would love to tell that story. I've, uh, I've had a few conversations with him through people. Um, it's still delicate because because Cool C is still on on death row with appeals and things like that. Um, but the Hilltop Hustler story, man, I already started, like, I did a couple, you know, did some research and, and filmed Dana Goodman, Karan, big up to Karan, who's my, who's my man, um, you know, uh, getting him involved in the story because this is, you know, this is really his family story. It's Karan Goodman and the Goodman family is the Hilltop Hustlers. You know, Steady B is the, is the nephew, cousin, um, and it's really their story. So I would really be telling the story of the Goodman brothers. Um, Dana, Dana Goodman and um, LG and that and LG and Lawrence, yeah, LG the teacher, yep. So I'm, I'm definitely, you know, definitely want to do it. Uh, and it may be something, you know, not a movie, but a, a television series or mini series or something like that. That's in, that's part of a bigger thing. It's yeah. so rich. I mean, they went to school. Fresh Prince was at Brooke at the time too. Yep. yep. I mean, then you got Schooly D was up the way. I remember. Yeah, yes. Hey, Parkside Killers. Yeah. Let me tell you, that was scary. They used to terrorize. My twin was at Shoemaker, oh, and wow. PSA used to go up there all the time. Like that's Jefferson or Master Street, I think, or something over there. Yeah, yeah. P it's PSK. A song. Some people don't know, like PSK. Like I'm really good friends with Ice T. I call him Uncle Ice, um, and he he will always tell you that his song Six in the Morning" was completely based on on Schooly D's PSK record and PSK. For people that don't know, it was an old school record and PSK still for Parkside Killers. It was 52nd and Jefferson, Parkside Avenue. Um, and those guys, 
you know, if you had to look at it back in the day, they weren't friends with anybody. They weren't friends with Hilltop. They wasn't friends with Winfield. They wasn't friends with 49th Street. They were their own, own gang. Their everybody, own gang. anybody could get it. Everybody could get it from PSK. So um, it was just interesting that little tidbit of history, which also would make its way into into a um, a biopic or a story about the Hilltop Hustlers, because you know people don't realize the culture, like the street culture of Philly, really. And it's not a Crip and Blood thing at all. It's not a Disciples thing. It's a it's a street gang thing. And it's hard to explain, like. That. My mom was one of the original Hilltop Hustlers. Oh, get out of here. Like like in the 50s. In oh, 60s, man. Like the 50s, 40s wow. and 50s. Uh, yeah. uh, late 40s, early 50s, mid 50s. When, because yeah. it really was about the Overbrook and. The school on the hill. Predominantly yeah. white and, 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 and going up to hill. Like it, it, it was, it was. Well, it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm like the third generation Overbrook High School. Right. So my 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 mother's two brothers went to Overbrook in the 1950s. And my uncle used to tell me a story where um, it was Overbrook was a white high school and blacks and most of Winfield was white. So all the black students had to travel up the hill to go to the school. And there were white gangs and there were black gangs. And he and my uncle, my uncle, the two of them would have these fights. And they formed gangs and cliques and stuff like that. And then in the 70s, when my cousins went, they about 10 years older than me, they went, it was the same thing. And so by the time I got there in the 80s, crack had hit. And so all the dynamics of everything sort of changed, right? And so um, we we grew up in that crack era of Overbrook. But Overbrook has such, such a rich history. And part of any sort of biopic about that city would would include Overbrook because it's it's in my heart. It's it's you know I love the fact that I graduated from Overbrook High School and oh. and I'm on the wall. You know I feel proud that I made it to the Wall of Fame at Overbrook mm -hmm. and I was inducted in. And so um, you know it was a great ceremony. I had my cousins with me who had all gone to Overbrook before me. Oh wow! Sitting at the table and uh, and it's funny. I showed up and and and. On a table, I was so uh, one of my bros from my chapter. He didn't go to Overbrook, but I had invited him, and he's older than me. He pledged me. And when I get there, there was an entire table full of alphas that had all gone to Overbrook, and I had seen these brothers in and out over the years, and they were a lot older than me. And I didn't realize, and it's like fourteen or fifteen alphas there. So there was so much pride in the fact that not only did I go to Overbrook, and I'm getting inducted into the the school hall of fame, but at this table are all these other Overbrook alumni who went on to college and pledge alpha and also, so it was, it was a great moment. I mean, that, I mean, we'll, we'll have to talk later. My mom has the, the well, my mother's gone now, but the mm. stories about back in the day, Overbrook are yeah. hilarious. Oh, I know. It was crazy. Hilarious. I mean, six year street. I mean, we, yeah. It's, we just got a, a, you have a great, great um, foundation and people are rooting for you. You represent people when you walk out. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. thank you for representing us well. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now I can't end this up without doing this really fast, fast trivia type thing, right? Okay. Okay. I'm going to say names, and you're going to tell me the first thing that pops in your mind. Okay, cool. Mind keeping no more than three words. Okay. Okay, cool. Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Um, the great greatest organization for black men. Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. A good organization copying from the greatest. <laughs> Kappa, Kappa Alpha Psi. Um, uh, another organization copying from the greatest. Um, Phi Beta Sigma. Um, another organization <laughs> copying from the greatest. Alpha Kappa Alpha, Sorority Incorporated. The sisters of the greatest organization. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Great. Watch it. Watch it. Great watch women. It. Great, great women. <laughs> <laughs> we honestly could stop there. But okay, right, right. The, the Zetas. Zetas, uh, Zetas, great sisterhood to the Sigmas. I, I, I actually love how they. You know, this their situation is is locked. And you guys too with the cues is pretty is is locked in. Yeah. And what about Sigma Gamma Rho? 
same thing. Great organization. Great organization. Any of these any of these organizations um, are just amazing for the upliftment, like I said earlier, of, of our culture. So, you know, getting involved in that. Everybody, not every, you know, you know, we have different mindsets and it's all it's it, on the surface. It's kind of fun. Right. The colors and you jab at each other. But the reality is we all have the same mindset, and the same goal. And you're trying to get to the same. And know, I don't want to be rude. I mean, the iotas. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the iotas divine. Now, you know, I just like for me, it was the Panhellenic and then it turned into the divine and to the divine nine. So we don't want to out them. I'll say this, though. There was a photo of. um around Martin Luther King's birthday. And I'd seen this photo before, but somebody had taken a photo and drew on the top of it. And it was the day before King got killed and they're all standing on the balcony. And there you have a member of, you have Dr. King is an alpha. Jesse Jackson is a Q. Abernathy is a noob. And there's another brother in the photo. And I'm, I can't remember who it is, but he was a Sigma. And above each of their heads was the organization drawn on that photo and it just showed like when we move when we move as one it's so it's great for us to have us when we move as one is like there's nothing that we can't that we can't accomplish there is nothing that we can't accomplish and i really want to extend to you like my fondest wish from all hip hop that with this this film we hope that it accomplishes everything that you guys seek out for it to have it's an amazing film we hope that Everybody gets a chance to see it. Yeah. Can you give us all the details? Where can they see yeah. it? When does it drop? All of those good things. So February 9th uh, is our release date. You find it on all platforms and Amazon. And, um, you know, our thing is there's no excuse not to watch this movie now. You don't have to go to a movie theater. You could just sit at home, watch it on your phone, watch it on your TV, watch it on your computer, watch it on your tablet. It's um, I think everyone will love it. It is a part of our culture, of black culture that we don't always get to see. It is um, a combination of our native heritage mixed in with what has become African-American, our what we call our hyphenated identity together. Um, it's college, it is uh, fatherhood, it's faith. It's a, it's a lot of different pieces. So I think um, everyone will enjoy it. I know I sure enjoyed it with my husband, who is a, um, a he's he's not just a GDI, he is a Nikki Fi Nikki. So we love that about him. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending Thank some time so with much. us. God bless. Thank you.